Well, what is up, all of our Liberty-loving friends? This is another fantastic episode of Good Morning Liberty. My name is Nate Thurston. I'm the co-host of this program. Charlie's not here. I didn't even tell the live group yet. He had a terrible sprain of his ankle over the weekend. Thought it was broken. Turns out it's just sprain, swollen up, all big and everything. His basketball career might be over. Uh, we will see. He should still be able to sit in a chair, though. So everything else is going to be fine, probably. Merry early Christmas or happy whatever else your holiday is that you're about to suffer through with your family. I'm kidding. It's going to be awesome. We all love it. This is the best time of the year because we get to watch all the best Christmas movies. Unless, of course, you don't uh, celebrate Christmas. In which case, I don't know. Maybe you'll still watch some of them because there's some pretty good ones. Live group. Live group right now. Name, okay, favorite, one. You get to pick one Christmas movie that is the best Christmas movie listed out. We'll go through those uh, later in the show before we end. So best Christmas movie. I've already watched a lot of my favorites. Santa Claus. We watched the Home Alones. I don't mess with the other Santa Clauses um, or Santa Cly. I don't know what you call that. Uh, what else? We watched Four Christmases last night. We watched Elf. We watched uh, Miracle on 34th Street, the one from the 90s, not the one from the 40s. And uh, what else did we go through? Uh, we watched Office Christmas Party, which is, you know, just kind of fun. I like Jason Bateman and uh, whatever dude's name is from Deadpool. Can't remember his name right now. It's a pretty funny one. And... Um, What's another one? It's a Wonderful Life. That's one that I'm going to be watching. Uh, always watch that every year. Uh, Scrooged, pretty good one. Um, Bill Murray, can't go wrong there. Uh, TJ Miller is the one that I was uh, talking about, Costco. Thank you for that one. Uh, I know him randomly from the movie Cloverfield, which was one of my favorite movies uh, a while back, and he was in that one. Pretty good in that movie. Um, Die Hard, of course. Um, when I get up to my mom's, uh, to, tonight or tomorrow, you see my mom and I, we got very similar movie choices. My wife and I, we do not. So I watched all the, a lot of the, uh, home alone, Santa Claus, all that stuff with my wife. I'm saving gremlins and die hard. And yes, Batman returns for when I go up there and watch some movies, uh, with, with my mom should be a good time. Don't forget about Batman returns. All right. That's a underrated Christmas movie. Okay. So we got some news that we're going to have to go through. I told everyone in the live group, uh, I got to go pretty a little bit faster today because I have a doctor's appointment I forgot about uh, until after I'd already told everyone what time I was going today and I did not want to change times. You can ask Charlie. I get very upset when I have to change times on things. I don't like it. So I wanted to stick to this today for everyone. The first thing we're going to mention because it's something that they're trying to it's just buried with everything else, and we're guilty of it as well. But this budget, this luckily we're going to fund our government. This is going to take $1.7 trillion and uh, about 4,000-page bill, and they need to go through that bill in a few days, you know, so we don't go through a, a shutdown. We need to make sure we fund the government. This is something that they always work out at the last minute where both sides make compromises. They end up spending more money than what the administration was even asking for on specific things. Um, this article, they're talking about it from Reason. Elizabeth Nolan Brown had a good breakdown of it. I just wanted to you know, did a, do a little simple math here. 4,000 pages. And um, they got this thing when? Today? Yesterday? That's a lot of reading. It's pretty sad that we've completely given up on the expectation that they're actually going to read the bill. Can we all at least accept how ridiculous that is? That they're, they're not going to read the bill. They're literally not going to. It's 4,000 pages, $1.7 trillion. It's going to be impossible to actually read through the bill. If you're going to read one page per minute, that's 60 pages per hour. You need to spend 66 hours reading the bill, and they need to pass this thing by Thursday so Biden can sign it on Friday. So you can spend 66 hours, maybe if you read constantly up until then. I don't know how much time is left over. That's one page per minute, and you're talking a, a, about a legal document. What if you needed to look something up or research something or use the bathroom or eat food or sleep or something like that? Then maybe you could do two minutes per page. So you're getting 30 pages per hour. That would take you 133 hours to read this bill. It's not physically possible for that to happen. And that's just reading straight through. Like I said, you're going to have to take breaks doing other stuff. This is yet another, we're going to pass the bill to find out what's in the bill. 
And listen, we're going to sit here and we're going to complain about it. Nothing's going to change until the people change and the, uh, the, the people change out those in Washington that are totally fine with this. But unfortunately, uh, a majority, a large part of the country likes this idea that we can get something for nothing and that we're always just going to be able to kick the can down the road and it's not going to affect us and we can just keep kicking it. You know, it's not even going to affect our children or our grandchildren. They're going to keep kicking the snowball. It's just going to keep going down the hill. As you roll through some of these expenditures in the bill, uh, $772.5 billion for non-defense discretionary programs, $858 billion for defense spending. That's a lot. Uh, that's more than what was even being asked for. Nina Turner has been posting about this, and I've been retweeting her in agreement. It's been a weird time, but it is Christmas season, okay? Um, we can cut the defense bill, and you always get pushback for this. You always get pushback for talking about this kind of thing. When you talk about cutting defense spending, that doesn't mean that we want the troops to eat less or that we want their pay to go down or whatever, uh, whatever benefits they get. You can take, that's a small portion of what is inside of this. You guys know what else is in there. We could throw out the ridiculous stuff, you know, like a $50,000 toilet seat or a $15,000 coffee mug, something like that. Way overspending on planes and trains and automobiles and boats, a lot of overspending on boats. They don't have any incentive to be cost effective. Why? Because you can't cut the defense bill. Jeez, I can't even mention cutting the defense bill without people acting like I, like I want to... <laughs> I don't end some of the troops' lives in effort to cut some of the money. That's not what you're talking about. This is a scapegoat. There's plenty of other things. They need to realize that this is not just foregone conclusion, that we're going to get more defense spending and it's going to go up every single year and you can charge whatever you want for every single thing. But unfortunately, that's the case, so why would you ever reduce it? All right, we'll keep going through here. $44.9 billion in an assistance package for Ukraine and NATO allies, which is more than we spent to help U.S. communities recovering from natural disasters. Uh, the bill, con the, uh, bill contains $1.8 billion for the CHIPS Act of 2022, which is, uh, in fact, just a big corporate welfare scam, and they're going to subsidize people to make chips here. They're going to take money from us and subsidize uh, them, help, help lower their costs. Uh, boatloads of cash going to cops. The bill includes $770.8 million for the Justice Assistance Grants, or JAG, which is uh, more... Than they had in 2022, uh, 324 million for the cops hiring program, which is 32 percent over the 2022 funding. The FBI, we might mention them in a bit. We could end up talking about the FBI sometime. They get a raise in this whole thing. Uh, where are they going? 11.3 billion dollars, which is 569 million dollars more than in 2022. 524 million more than what Biden even requested. A summary from the House Appropriations Committee says this will help expand efforts to investigate extremist violence and domestic terrorism. You guys think that this, uh, that this train's coming off the tracks? You guys think this uh, intelligence community's coming down? or No, just give them a little bit more, more money. They can do a better job. U.S. attorneys getting $2.63 billion, an increase of $212 million above 2022, including to further support prosecutions related to the January 6th attack on the Capitol and domestic terrorism cases. Then you also got the cyber cops and the immigration cops. ICE is going to be getting $8.42 billion, which is $161 million more than in 2022, $300 million more than what Biden requested. The Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, is getting $2.9 billion, which is up $300 million from 2022, and $400, $400 million more than what Biden requested. Then you got all your normals out there. 118 billion for veterans, med medical care, 47 billion for the National Institutes of Health, 9 billion for the CDC, 12 billion for Head Start. Listen, when you look through all this stuff, here's what you found out. We got plenty of money. We didn't got any money problems. Everything's fine. Tax receipts could be uh, suffering a little bit as we go into a recession. Maybe this is going to be spending the entire amount that we take in taxes for the entire year. I don't know. And it's not like we're not going to spend more money, but hey, who cares? It's going to kick the can down the road, everyone. Everything's going to be fine. None of this changes until the people change, and the people change the people that are making all of these decisions. All right? 
I'm going to brush over this conversation before we get to the Twitter files release, which I thought was the most important one so far. I got a little bored with them. This one had a little bit more juice to it. But before that, shocking events seem to be showing that the uh, CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, had something to do with JFK's assassination. I know. I know. I had no... There was just no clue that this was going to be the case. This was um, 59 years ago now, I guess. What is that? 11 63 I know that because of the TV show. That was pretty good. 11 63 So um, this isn't a big surprise to everyone. In fact, I'm not going to get into all the nitty-gritty on it because there's a lot of nitty and quite a bit of gritty, too. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to link you to some pretty good articles from The Intercept and some other people, and maybe even that really good Tucker Carlson video go, going around explaining a lot of this, um, because it's not something I've dug a lot into. The non-shocking factor is that they've been polling people on their thoughts on the JFK assassination. Like Gallup has and other agencies have since 1963. People have been polling. And uh, this study right here, this was uh, posted by uh, Axios. And it comes from, let's see, Amandi International, Ben Dixon and Amandi International 2022 National Voter Poll about the JFK assassination. They went through 2,000 people, your normal sample size for a poll. And this was from November 14th, November 22nd of this year. Just did the poll. Margin of error, 2.2 percentage points at a 95% confidence level. Uh, what I think is pretty interesting here, this first graph, this goes from 1963, and it This is a Gallup one. It tracks up to 2011. And the darker green here, this is who thinks that one man assassinated JFK and then who thinks that there were other people involved. From the very beginning, you had about 30% of people believe the official story. And about 52% of people thought there were more people involved. It went up to 36% of people in the mid-60s thought they believed the official story on the matter. Now, as you go through the 70s, you get some of the Vietnam War stuff. Maybe you get some Nixon stuff going on. It drops down to 11% believe the official story on the matter. Uh, When people start to distrust the government, you know. Interestingly enough, after 9-11, it pops back up to about 19% believe the official story. And right now, uh, well, sorry, 2011-ish, it gets up to uh, 30% believing that it was one person who did this. Uh, the other ones think that there were others involved. It gets up to as high as 81% think that there were other people involved. Now, when they did this survey, do you think that it was one person, Lee Harvey Oswald, responsible, or do you think that other people were involved? Out of the 2,000 people survey, 50% of the people believe that there were others involved in the conspiracy, meaning they did not believe the official story on the matter. And why would you? Why would they be hiding so many documents almost 60 years later? Why would the CIA be? It was just this guy, he shot him, and then miraculously some other lone gunman comes up and shoots this lone gunman, and that guy happens to be declared insane by a CIA psychiatrist. Why would you not believe the story? I don't know. It's a perfectly laid out chain of events that makes perfect sense. Well, 50% of the people do not believe the, uh, the official story. Surprisingly enough, in 2022, November 2022, 38% of people believe that one person, Lee Harvey Oswald, was responsible for the assassination. Trust in the intelligence community at all-time highs, according to that previous Gallup survey. Now, when you go to those 50% of people who uh, don't believe the official narrative, Of the 50%, the majority of them, 31%, by majority I mean the biggest group, believed that it was the CIA who did it. And so, to me that's pretty important because now you're looking at something around 20% of the survey, sorry, 15, 15, 16% of the people think that the CIA actually did this. In the U.S., here in America, 2022, big portion of things the CIA. Then you got the mafia, you got Cuba, you got Soviet Union, and uh, probably some people think it was Trump did it. I don't know. Uh, I'm not real sure. Why is all this important? We're about to talk about the Twitter files here in a minute. 
Now, under a law that was passed in 1992, the files were supposed to be released by October 2017, but President Donald Trump delayed their release until October 2021. Now, I go so back and forth on Trump because he's supposed to be fighting the deep state. He's against the deep state. He doesn't, you know, he thinks that they're all corrupt and they're working against the interests of the American people. And then it's October 2021. This happened in 1963. Sorry, it's October 2017. Uh, this happened in 1963. And I uh, can't release him. Got to push it back until the next administration. And then President Biden delayed in 2021 until December 15th of this year at the request of the CIA and the FBI under the grounds that releasing the remaining files represented identifiable harm to the national interest. So then they go through and they ask in this survey, do you think that all of this should be released? And 71% of the people surveyed uh, do believe that this should be released. And they should be. I don't know why uh, Trump went along with the idea of not releasing them in order to protect, likely, the intelligence community unless it would have actually harmed more national security that we are not aware of and that we could only speculate on. So I will put a link to the intercept piece about Lee Harvey Oswald and connections to the CIA, LSD, and the new clues and the newly declassified documents. They will explain it way better than I did. We're going to move on to the Twitter files uh, because I do only have about 20 minutes left. So Michael Schellenberger, uh, author of a good book called Apocalypse Never, you should pick out. I do like, I like the fact that Musk picked Michael Schellenberger to be one of the people releasing the Twitter files. I think that's pretty cool. Uh, the others, great too. They've done great work. I like this specifically because this is going to drive a lot more attention to Michael Schellenberger. He's already been on Rogan several times, so he's a big author. Well, a lot more attention in that book, Apocalypse Never, uh, about the climate activists. Uh, the climate change movement is an important book. And so is uh, San Francisco, I think, is the other newer one that he had. And so I like the fact that there's traffic being driven to uh, these people's work. And uh, what's the thing that they started, free press, whatever it is? So uh, that's good, too. Probably some good things going to come from those people having more of an audience. So he says, uh, this is part seven. This has to do with the Hunter Biden laptop. We found out more things in this, by the way, and more things that we had found out previously. That's why I wanted to actually dig through these like we did with some of the earlier, uh, some of the earlier things. How the FBI and intelligence community discredited factual information about Hunter Biden's foreign business dealings both after and before the New York Post revealed the contents of his laptop. The before part I find to be very important in this scenario. So we know the story about the computer store owner gets left, all right, he uh, contacts the FBI and lets them know that Hunter Biden left it. They end up subpoenaing him for the laptop, and they take it, all right? Like a year later, he still hadn't heard back from the FBI, even though uh, he, even though he had discovered evidence of criminal activity, so he emails Rudy Giuliani, who was under FBI surveillance at the time, and in early October, Giuliani gives it to the New York Post. Now, this is very important. This person emails Rudy Giuliani, and at the time, the FBI is surveilling Rudy Giuliani. And then Giuliani gives it to the New York Post. And the FBI, because they are surveilling this, know that Giuliani has the contents of the laptop and that he's given it to the New York Post. That ends up being very important that they knew that this was that this specific information was going to be released. So FBI special agent Elvis Chan sends 10 documents to Twitter's then head of site integrity, Yul Roth, through Teleporter, which is a one-way communications channel from the FBI to Twitter, tells him about the documents he's going to be sending over the next day, October 14th, 2020, the New York Post runs the story about Hunter Biden's laptop, Biden's secret emails. So during all of 2020, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies repeatedly primed Yul Roth to dismiss reports of the laptop as part of a Russian hack and leak operation. 
So Yul Roth gave a sworn declaration in December of 2020, said during these weekly meetings, federal law enforcement agencies communicated that they expected hack and leak operations by state actors uh, might occur in the period shortly before the 2020 presidential election, likely in October. I was told in these meetings that the intelligence community expected that individuals associated with political campaigns would be subject to hacking attacks and that material obtained through those hacking attacks would likely be disseminated over social media platforms, including Twitter. These expectations of hack and leak operations were discussed throughout 2020. I also learned in these meetings that there were rumors that a hack and leak operation would involve Hunter Biden. The FBI, by the way, they continuously are asking for um, information from Twitter that they are finding these uh, foreign interference influence uh, actions taking place on Twitter. Now, they keep asking, and Twitter keeps saying, well, actually, we're not seeing anything. We're not finding that, that any foreign uh, governments are trying to influence anything uh, before this election. And the FBI just keeps asking, why do they need to do that? You ever see those stats where like, well, the FBI, they foiled this many plots uh, in this year. So we actually need to expand their surveillance capabilities. Look at all these plots that they stopped. And we got to keep giving them all this power. That's why they're looking for more and more things so they can say, well, look at all these potential foreign influence campaigns that were stopped because of what we are doing in, through our conversations with Twitter. They then arrange, Elvis Chan arranges for top security, top secret security clearance for Twitter executives so that the FBI can share information about threats to upcoming elections. Top secret security clearance for people working at Twitter and likely other social media platforms, other news organizations. You'll see that they were talking to uh, also the New York Times, the Washington Post, and of course all the other social media companies. Here's where it gets Kind of weird. In August of 2020, Elvis shares information with uh, Yul Roth relating to the Russian hacking organization APT28 through the FBI Secure One Way Communications channel. And there's actually a uh, good little clip of Yul talking about this. So I'll play that right quick. We learn about DC leaks and we learn about the intersection between APT28 a unit of Russian military intelligence, a hacking group. And so the morning of the Hunter Biden story in the New York Post happens, and it was weird, right? We didn't know what to believe. We didn't know what was true. There was, there was smoke. And ultimately for me, uh, it didn't reach a place where I was comfortable removing this content from Twitter but it set off every single one of my finely tuned APT28 hack and leak campaign alarm right, bells. So it looked possibly probably. It, everything about it. So they basically had been running a long con on Yul Roth. Uh, not that he doesn't share, uh, doesn't have any blame here in doing this, but they've been running this long con, uh, this training this uh, Pavlov's training exercise on Yul Roth. And when he sees uh, this information come out, he's thinking, okay, well, this could be it. Uh, this could be the thing. But he's not all the way there on this being the thing. He takes a little bit of extra push, and that is uh, former FBI uh, general counsel, uh, now Twitter employee Jim Baker, he is the one who ends up helping push Yul Roth over the edge. Keeps saying, "Hey, this is uh, this. I mean, this seems like hacked information. This fits every single thing that they've been talking about, man. I mean, look at this. This is also a guy. Michael Schellenberger points out played a central role in making the case for an investigation of Donald Trump. You guys remember that uh, super important investigation that we all talked about for years. So um, maybe this guy's not on the up and up. So he's pushing Yul Roth." And now one thing I've noticed is a lot of people are wanting to make Baker a fall guy. He was just a guy who, uh, yeah, sure, he was working from the inside. And what's going to end up happening is maybe even the FBI, maybe everyone can point to this, oh, this Jim Baker guy, he's the one who was pushing uh, for this to be censored. And, of course, we need to do something to him. Well, why did the FBI hold these uh, ridiculous sessions that we're about to talk about 
concerning these possible scenarios that could be coming up. By the way, there were so many people from the FBI working with Twitter that they even had their own translation system for uh, the FBI's lingo and Twitter's lingo for new people coming over from the Bureau to work at Twitter. And they had to have these little cheat sheets running around out there so people would know all the shorthand lingo that they were talking through. So that's awesome. Here's where it gets even crazier. Efforts continued to influence the old Roth. In September, September of 2020, Roth participated in an Aspen Institute tabletop exercise on a potential hack and dump operation relating to Hunter Biden. Once again, in September, he participated in a tabletop exercise on a potential hack and dump operation relating to Hunter Biden. The goal was to shape how the media covered it and how social media carried it. As they are running a, a drill on a potential situation, and they have this whole thing lined out. <clears throat> on day one, anonymous website, bidencrimes.info, and a, and a Twitter account, at Hunter LOLs, begin posting documents that purport to be from Burisma tied to Hunter Biden. Splashed across the top of the site in English, Joe Biden betrayed America before for money. He'll do it again. Initially, the documents, mostly in Ukrainian, appear to be minutes of various Burisma board meetings. They are literally holding what-if training preparation sessions on what they would do if information regarding Hunter Biden and his business dealings with Burisma in Ukraine were eventually going to come out on, on social media. Day two, the Drudge Report links to the anonymous website BidenCrimes.info, and the site is quickly picked up by other fringe media and begins to spread. Day three, Fox and Friends discusses the Biden Crimes info, and at 7 o'clock, Donald Trump tweets six minutes later, Joe Biden's biggest criminal of all time. Check out Hunter LOLs at Hunter LOLs. Three reporters, and they name these reporters, are contacted by an anonymous Proton Mail account, Biden Crimes. And uh, each sent documents. Documents seem to be a ledger of payments showing that Hunter Biden was paid $3 million over two months in 2015 by Burisma, far more than he had been reported publicly before. Donnie's document is a 2016 email pur purportedly from Hunter to his father dated the evening before the firing of prosecutor Victor Shokin, <laughs> simply titled Burisma in the body, which reads, I really need you to do this for me. This is before all this stuff came out. I'll tell you one thing. They never thought that Elon Musk was going to buy Twitter. That's what I found out. Um, they, they, they never thought that anyone was going to see any of this stuff. This is, this is completely ridiculous. And then Burisma says they have no evidence of any, of any hacked servers. So Burisma denying. That's even in this thing. Day four, the Biden campaign. Adopting the policy of Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016 says they will not confirm the veracity of any documents. CrowdStrike announces, without further detail, it has reason to believe that Biden crimes is the work of APT 28. Now they're talking about how this is all a, all a hack thing. Washington Post publishes a story confirming that the board contract given to her is legitimate. There's no wrongdoing evident. They run through the whole thing day by day. <clears throat> I, hold on. <clears throat> I cannot believe that they didn't delete all this, just like what Tom is just saying. How did they not delete this stuff? I thought for sure that this stuff was all going to be gone. And maybe they thought it was deleted. You know, they found it wherever it is that you find documents after you put them in the trash can, you know. Things aren't really deleted. So maybe that's where they found them. I don't know if this was just as simple as searching Gmail for a keyword. FBI, or something like that. Surely not. This keeps going all the way down to day six, day seven. Sunday shows Biden campaign dismissed the entire hack and leak as dirty tricks by Vladimir Putin. After the morning shows air, the Daily Beast quotes two former senior intelligence officials that the directors of the CIA and NSA refused to sign on to Ratcliffe's Friday statement, although sources differ on why they did not sign it. David Sanger matches that reporting an hour later. Alex Berenson announces on Twitter that he's conducted an interview via direct message with Hunter LOLs and that he believes the person is an American. Yeah, so um, this is really, 
This is uh, this is insane. The organizer was Vivian Schiller, former CEO of NPR, former head of news at Twitter, former general manager of New York Times, former general digital officer of NBC News. Attendees included Meta's Facebook, uh, Meta Facebook's head of security policy, and top national security reporters for New York Times and the Washington Post. So hopefully we dig more into Vivian Schiller and see who see, she's uh, shilling for, if you know what I mean. Now they got this encrypted messaging network set up so employees from FBI and Twitter could communicate. That's awesome. Got to streamline this whole process. When it's posted, Yul Roth is saying, eh, I don't know. I'm not sure if this is uh, exactly the hacked material policy. And um, Baker, Jim Baker comes in and said, no, 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 it's, uh, this is it. No, here, look at this news story. Look at this news story from, uh, from The Guardian. See, they're saying that this is actually hacked materials. And so... <laughs> They end up, of course, doing what you know that they did. Uh, Baker continues saying, I've seen some reliable cybersecurity folks question the authenticity of the emails in another way, uh, saying that there's no metadata pertaining to them that has been released, and the formatting looks like it could be complete fabrications, is what Jim Baker is saying. This is a mess. This whole thing is a mess. And then you add in just a little bit more, just one little sprinkle on top. The FBI uh, paid Twitter $3.4 million for all the time spent talking to the FBI about all this stuff. $3.4 million paid to Twitter by the FBI. $3.4 million to a company that has never made a profit before. And here they are paying them uh, for talking to legal teams and uh, to all the FBI people, of course, for their time going through and you can make the case for why they should pay someone for combing through all this stuff. And they will be able to do that. And they won't be able to prove this is not wrongdoing. They weren't actually working for them. This is Twitter freely deciding that they're going to help out the FBI. And of course, the FBI being good people, there's a lot of fine people over there. And they're going to reimburse for all of their time, of course, because uh, this is a corporation and they're and they're taking up a lot of their valuable time. So... Uh, 3.4 million. That's not too bad. And by the way, this is still going on August of 2022. They are still asking, uh, they are still asking for uh, more FBI emergency disclosure requests. Um, they want to be able to do more warrantless searches and not have to go through as many channels. Um, this is a, uh, this is a real big mess, real big mess that's going on. And what do you do about it? Well, Elon Musk looks like he wants to step down. And honestly, first off, he already said that he wasn't going to remain CEO of Twitter. He said that from the time that he said he was going to buy it. And before he bought it, he said that he was only going to come in for a little bit and then appoint someone else to take his place. Uh, so that's it's not as big a news. In fact, last, time, last week, I mentioned that to the trading class, that was probably going to be coming up sometime uh, because of all the stuff that was going on with a Tesla tanking and he had already said he wasn't going to remain CEO of Twitter. And so he ends up putting up this poll, which um, uh, we know how Elon's polls are. He, they go the way that he thought they were going to go. So it seems like he's not going to be a CEO, but of course he's still going to own it. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be reliant on the right person running the day-to-day -day operations but I don't know what we're going to do because dismantling the FBI and the CIA and all that, uh, good luck with that. Who's going to investigate all this, by the way? The Department of Justice? The FBI? Who's, who's going to look into this? So they'll find someone to look into it. I'm hoping that maybe this is one good part about uh, Republicans having control of the House. They could be likely... Uh, to initiate some type of a investigation, something into this whole thing. That's a dangerous job, by the way. There's a reason we talked about JFK beforehand. There's a reason we're about to mention quickly what was done to Donald Trump over the last few years. Some of it, of course, a lot of it he did to himself. Uh, but it doesn't normally go well for people who talk out, who speak out against the deep state. Generally, you want to stay in their uh, good graces, you know. 
And you think about this whole, this web that's going on. It, just going back to 2016, you're talking about the intelligence community perpetrating this, this false theory, which looks like it was on behalf of the Clinton campaign, to painting Trump as a Russian asset, as Putin's puppet, and initiating this investigation, spying on his campaign, basically making him look like an illegitimate president after he got elected, which is not good for, the, for our country as a whole to have that whole illegitimate president thing in, right? It was denied by everyone. I won't say everyone, that's an absolute, you know, by a lot of people in high offices, the media, of course, a lot of people on the left. We spent years with the DOJ investigating Trump. They spent millions of dollars. They didn't find anything except for wrongdoing on the part of the people that were uh, calling him a Russian plant. And then you got the intelligence community actively working to block a story uh, that would make Trump's challenger look bad before the next election. And they're actively working to censor certain viewpoints. Of course, Trump loses the election, kind of went off the rails a little bit here. I'm sick of him talking about him, you know, but he was done a bit dirty while he was president. Well, it's just, he probably deserves it. You know, if you look through all his life, probably deserves it. I don't know, but uh, uh, not for some of these specific circumstances. You know, hopefully not. Hopefully we don't all just get what's coming to us. That'd be bad for, for everyone, probably. And what does all this mean for the whole Hunter Biden story thing? What's going to happen with it? This isn't just this isn't just the intelligence community working to censor something to make uh, to make to help Biden look okay before an election because they preferred Biden. You know they want to help him look okay. This is the this is the Department of Justice working to censor reports and evidence of corruption at the highest levels of our government before an election. Kind of screwed right now if you ask me. So does all of this matter? I don't know if it all matters, but you can go to godhatesfeds.com and get yourself a Twitter files matter because they do actually matter. Now, does that mean there will be change? Not until we take away some of the power from the government. They're always going to be able to do this. You can make the case that they could talk to Twitter and say, oh, hey, you know, actually we do monitor a lot of communications from overseas and a lot of national security and uh, it does turn out that, um, you know, that's, that's what's going on, right? People will be able to make the case, and they're probably going to win on that case more than likely that they can speak to them. The problem is there's always the threat of the use of force. There always is. You got the FTC. You got the SEC. Not going to let them be. We all know that. You got the antitrust laws. I mean, you got the DOJ can use the FTC to go after these companies using the antitrust, saying that they got too many powers, that they're too big, that, uh, that they're causing harm to consumers, uh, that, they're, that they're allowing uh, misinformation to come out. Of course, the uh, DHS and all of them, they're all going through uh, worried about misinformation and uh, that they're allowing foreign adversar adversaries. To come. I mean, literally, it's a mess. And until you take away some of their powers, instead of upping their budget like we just did, like a lot of Republicans are going to sign on to do, and like all the Democrats are going to want to do, uh, this stuff isn't going to get any better. It's going to get better with the people getting better and the people actually requiring this as a, uh, this is a requirement to get my vote on anything. You must do this. And as enough people do that, then you'll find the right people or even the wrong people will do the right thing because they only care about keeping their jobs. Now, Trump, the big news, who criminal, criminal referral. He's facing indictments. They've officially, ceremoniously um, suggested that he should be indicted for criminal charges relating to January 6th. You already know our thoughts on this. Say what you will about Trump. He didn't get my vote two different times. Um, I think specifically getting screwed here again. If he would stop being such a narcissist, I would have a little bit more sympathy for him. But I'll give you as much sympathy as I can right now. There is a reason that we started with um, 
the deep state getting more money in the new budget, the theories and revelations about JFK, and you can look up why the CIA might have wanted to do that, the Department of Justice controlling our media and an effort to prevent Trump from winning re-election and initiating total BS investigations into him. And then here we are still talking about our ceremonious, ceremonial uh, indictments and criminal charges against Trump. He still would not get my vote again. I would not vote for him for a third time, but I am a fair enough person to know when someone uh, is getting screwed over by people who might not even be elected uh, in, in the power. So uh, this is a mess, and it's going to continue to be a mess, but we got to keep talking about it and changing people's minds. Thank you for listening. i got to get this out here and go to my doctor's appointment. Merry Christmas. Uh, happy whatever it is to all the stuff that... um. You guys are celebrating whatever your religion is or whatever. Just go have a good time with your family. Okay. I got Die Hard. I got Gremlins. I got Elf in here. I got It's a Wonderful Life. I'm going to watch all those. I mean, out of those, clearly, um, a Die Hard. I mean, that's the best Christmas movie, right? I think that's the best one. I'm going to watch Gremlins for sure. It's a Wonderful Life. It's like barely Christmas, by the way. It's like hardly any Christmas. And it's a wonderful life. I get it. You watch it at Christmas and it, it ends, you know, the Christmas tree and it's around Christmas. I get it. It's kind of like barely Christmas though, right? It's just something that we watch. Anyway, watch that with your family as I am going to happily watch with mine. Until next week after this holiday, everyone have a good morning, Liberty, have a good week, Liberty, have a good Christmas, Liberty, have a good Liberty, Liberty, and you know the thing.